And a very large hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sunset Safari. Starting it off on a large Marula hunting elephant note. Welcome for new viewers that don't know me. My name is Jamie. I have Andrew on camera with me this afternoon. And we have some sad, sad news. Poor old Rusty is out of commission temporarily. Luckily, VM raced in on a town mission to go and rescue the, or get some new wheel bearings. And Opa, our wonderful mechanic, is working on the problem as we speak. So if you're lucky, you might also get to see Brent and Tebs out this afternoon. Don't forget, this is a live safari, so it's happening right here. In this particular case, on quarantine clearings, we drive throughout Juma and Arethusa game reserves within the Sabi Sands, the greater Kruger area of South Africa. And at the moment, it is Marula fruit season. And these two young bulls have been making short work of whatever nice ripe marulas they can find. It's so much fun watching the way that they operate. Double checking the marulas, making sure they get the nice ones. Hello, boy. <laughs> what a wonderful, oh, good afternoon. Are well, those marulas making you flatulent? Don't forget as well that you can send us through any questions or comments that you may have. You can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And what an awesome way to start our live safari. The wonderful fruiting marula tree that is a stalwart, one of the biggest trees that we have out here. And at the moment is currently dropping fruit all over the place which means it's snack time for hungry elephants. They're really enjoying the sweet taste of the marula fruits. And after these guys disappear, we'll stop and have a look at them. Although they've made short work, actually. When we first arrived, there were marulas all over the floor. And the two of them together have slowly removed them. Now, marula fruits are very clever because they ripen once they fall off the tree. And quite often, elephants don't really chew them. They just sort of swallow, and if you think about it, it's a great way of distributing the fruits, or the seeds of the fruit, to different areas around the park. And not just that, when they come out in the ele elephant's dung, they have ready-made fertilizer to help the, marulas, the young marula trees grow. <laughs> in Mumbai, absolutely, they have, between the two of them, devoured easily 20 fruit while we were just sitting here in the last two minutes or so. S grabbing them in their wonderful trunks and then popping them into their mouths. Now the thing about quarantine though is that it doesn't really have much to keep them here apart from the marula fruit. So they're moving around the area from tree to tree and it's fascinating. I'd love to know exactly how they decide that they're done with these particular marula fruits. Maybe by smell, because all of the remaining ones, while I look out of the corner of my eye, all of the remaining ones are still green and not the nice yellow ripe color that they get in a couple of days' time. So what if the elephants are just rejecting them on that basis and have decided to go look for riper ones? Which are much, speaking from experience, because humans can eat them too, much nicer to eat, much juicier and much sweeter than the green unripe fruits. Moni, who's watching in London, I will absolutely with pleasure show you a marula fruit. I will, if I find a nice one, I will even eat it for you and try and describe the experience as I do. But I want to just try and catch up with those two balls before they disappear and we can get maybe one last view of them. Young males, one in particular that we were watching it came up nice and close to the car. He's probably only just left the safety of his herd. Luckily he's got a buddy to keep him company in this wild world. The rest of the herd is on their way, or they might be around Gallego Pad actually. <laughs> I think I think Eugene's just encountered them. <laughs> you can see 
how this is playing out. I can see Eugene. Ah, oh, I think he's made it around the corner. So yes, Monique, with pleasure, I will have a look around. I'll find you the fruit and I'll describe it for you. my favorite questions that Eric has asked. I mean, Eric wants to know a little bit more about an elephant's foot. Let's see if these two boys are comfortable enough to let us get a nice view of their feet because the elephant feet are incredible. Okay boy. All right boy. Yes, hello. <laughs> they found their next stash of marula fruits. I'm going to eat all the ripe ones, Monique, and then I'm going to have to try and eat an unripe one for you. That's disappointing. Snuffling around. So Eric wants to know a little bit about the structure of the Ellie's feet. And one constant remark that we get from the various guests that I've had over the years is how incredible the fact that a five ton or six ton in the big bulls cases animal can move as silently as they do through the bush and that's largely because of these incredible feet so elephants have a almost unique structure they walk right on the tips of their toes of all five they have five toes they're hidden in that spongy pad of the foot and watch as the elephant lifts and then puts it down you can see how it spreads the weight over the ground and when i say they walk on the tips of their toes Within that foot structure, there's a thick padding of tissue and subcutaneous fat. And then above that is actually where the elephant's toes sit. And in a moment when I have the opportunity, I'll be able to show you sort of roughly what I mean with my hands. But let's keep his view, or this view of his feet, while we answer the question. In terms of toenails, they do have them. They have four, sometimes five on the front and three, sometimes four, on the back. I think they lose them in a natural way at times, because I have seen elephants with odd-numbered toenails. And it's just a little extra way of reinforcing the edges of the feet. Oh, don't turn away, boy. We want to look at your toenails. That's not weird at all. Come back. We want a closer examination. <laughs> Strangely enough, as we drove up, Andrew actually remarked upon the fact that this little elephant has very shiny toenails, unusually shiny toenails. I don't know if it's because he spent the day in the pan, but the little edges of the toenails are a great way to reinforce the sides of the foot, especially when they're used for digging, which he might, I don't think he's gonna do, there's not much for him to dig for here. But just provides an extra layer of protection. And I would say, Elephant toenails are constructed pretty much in the same way that human fingernails are. So just layers and layers upon, of, or layers upon layers of keratin all bunched together. I imagine though that I would never want to have to try and trim an elephant's toenails. I can only imagine it would be an impossible task. You can see how that trunk is working to sniff around and find the next marula. The eyesight is okay, but it's not fantastic. It's much easier to... <laughs> There's some to your left, boy. To your left. You are the left. <laughs> Fascinating to watch the way they operate. Nope, that's a termite hole. You don't want to put your trunk in there. There you go. They almost, almost, almost. Yay! Well done. And the next one. Almost. There we go. <laughs> trunk back down on the ground. All done by smell and by feel. <laughs> Not that easy. I imagine that elephants have a pretty large blind spot just below their trunks. I can't see how they could ever see down that, in that direction. There you go, 
uh, the youngsters come back to present us with another nice view. Oh, what was that? Five in one go. Impressive. And that is how they clear up this, they've actually, oh! <laughs> It was, it was a very startled monkey. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> They're abandoning ship. There's going to be another one that comes down here, I think. I didn't even see them. Oh, <laughs> they're down again. <laughs> That's really quite a jump. There's another one coming. Oh, that one took the, the, the trunk route. There's one more watching the elephants. Wants to be reunited with the rest of its group. <laughs> that was very funny. I didn't even realize they were up there. I did not see them at all. So busy watching the elephants' trunks and feet. I think they got quite a surprise. Well, they decided they simply couldn't stick it out any longer. Shame. There's still one up in that tree. I can't see where it went, but it hasn't come down. The rest of the family have just raced off and left it. Now trapped in a tree, guarded by two big male elephants. You see him there? Yes. <laughs> oh well. It's okay. These ellies are going to move off fairly soon. They've pretty much gobbled up almost all of the marula fruits that were on the ground when we first arrived here. Did that monkey jump from That monkey jumped here. from there. It was one of the, it, it almost parachuted down. I don't know how to describe it. It had its limbs spread out like it was trying to break the fall. It was fascinating. I mean, uh, I mean that height is easily, I would say, jumped from about 10 meters, which is, what is that in feet? It's about 30 feet that it just jumped and landed on the ground. We know, of course, that they're very agile animals, but it was almost like a, a belly flop in a way. I mean, if you think about how tall these elephants are, you can get an idea of something of the scale of this beautiful giant marula. And this, by the way, is a female marula tree. Marula trees are what's known as dioecious. So they're either male or female. Those are on the separate trees. And Monique, there's a marula fruit for you <laughs> before they gobble it all. Obviously, I can't hop out just at the moment to demonstrate what they taste like. I don't think these Eddies would be very impressed with me coming to share their afternoon lunch. Now, somewhere around here as well is where Scott saw that Faroe's eagle owl. And I'm going to be keeping an eye out for him as, at the same time. I don't think the monkeys would have been that comfortable, though, if he had been around. Oh, you don't want to share. I have seen elephants do that before. I've actually seen them take food out of another elephant's mouth. And that Ellie bull went straight towards trying to put his trunk in his buddy's mouth. Breaking the marula fruit cycle with a couple of perennial plants. Fortunately for these guys, there's not many of them left, even the drought that we've experienced. And it is, I must tell you, it is now blazing hot again. We went, went through a bit of a cold snap. It's now 33 degrees centigrade, so 92 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh boy. When you finished with those marulas, you gobbled them all now. Now I'm gonna have to struggle to find one to answer Monique's question. Luckily they are falling all the time. James Richards, yes indeed. Elephants, monkeys and marulas. It is all happening on Safari Live. That's one of my favorite things. I mean, you never, you just don't expect a monkey to come barreling out of a tree like that while you're watching elephants. It would be very funny if they'd startled the elephants. Afternoon, there's Shlamid Lov on, around, in and around quarantine. I know the updates. Sorry guys, just letting Ephraim know what's happening this afternoon. 
is they wander off. It gives me a perfect opportunity to just hop out and go and find a marula fruit for Monique and actually give you a little bit of an idea of the scale of the tree. I'm just going to drive forward a little bit so I can go and stand underneath where the monkey jumped out of. I'm about, to put this scale in a bit of perspective, I'm about five foot seven. Not, not very tall, definitely not nearly Brent or Brian's giant size, but probably the same as James. And if you can get a sort of rough idea, check for more elephants, or maybe a monkey's gonna come flying out and knock me on the head. Wouldn't be that unexpected. get a bit of an idea as to the scale of how far that monkey actually fell down before it landed on the ground. And it really was like a belly flop. Okay, so let's collect some interesting things. Monique and the rest of you who might have been wondering about what that elephant was eating. This is a whole marula fruit. It's very, very unripe, so I won't be munching on that one. I'll have to find a nice yellow one to eat. And what you do, if I can, or I'll tell you the technique now so we can use it in the future. You mash up the fruit without taking the skin off. You mash the fruit in your hand and then you bite a tiny little hole in the skin and you split it open and you can suck the juice out that way and then eat the rest of the fruit within it. It's actually quite a messy fruit to eat. It's not an easy one. As you can see, the Ellie's don't always take all of their lunch with them. This is one that's fallen out of the elephant's mouth. They don't really necessarily chew them completely either. So it's only partially eaten, this one. Can you move it into the light? Life a little bit. Like, there we go. Thank you, Andrew. Is that light? Yes. Yes, perfect. Awesome. So you can see how fleshy the fruit is. These are very, very unripe. We'll have to try and find a nice ripe one to show you. And then here, we've got some marula fruits. Oopsie. We've got marula fruit that has been eaten probably by something else. And the reason I say that, and it could well be those monkeys that we were watching, they abandoned the seed and they essentially ate all of the fruit around it. And generally, elephants aren't that picky. And this, by the way, now this is old. This is a marula fruit seed. And these little holes here are from one very specialized little creature and that's the tree squirrel. And what they do is they pop open the outside coating of the seed and they get into the nutrient rich center order to provide themselves with that extra protein of the seed as well as some kind of access to the oils as well. There's very fatty oils in Marula. It's very common to find that and that you'll probably find has come from a squirrel finding the Marula fruit like the one I showed you that I said might have been eaten by the monkey and then utilizing the rest of it. So for a lot of marula fruits or marula seeds, it actually doesn't, they never reach the point of germinating. We actually don't see that many young marulas either. monkey species that you're likely to see in the Sabi sands and that's the vervet monkey. Vervet? <laughs> when I was a kid I used to call them velvet monkeys. That was just what I assumed they were. I thought they were velvet monkeys but it's not. It's vervet monkeys. We also do occasionally see baboons. I've yet to manage to get them on a live safari so that's the other big primate that you might see out here and then of course the tiny tiny little nocturnal 
little bush babies or nakapis, which means little night, little night monkey. You might see when it starts to get a bit cooler, it starts to get dark. Monique, I agree with you. I love watching the way that those trunks operate. It is exactly like Monique described it, a hand on the end of an arm. And Mercedes, you were wondering about, you've got the thick, thick skin of the elephant. And you'll notice that when you watch them, you'll never see ox peckers on them. And there's two reasons for that. The first is an answer to Mercedes' question. Mercedes, no. Generally, elephants don't have that many ticks on them, not to the same extent that something like a rhino or a buffalo or a giraffe might have. There will be ticks in some of the more sensitive areas, the soft areas where the, thin is a bit, the skin is a bit thinner. So maybe around underneath the tail, possibly behind the ears to an extent. But generally, they don't carry the same number of ticks that you would expect, and that's mainly because their skin is so thick. that Andrew and I can sit in the shade. <coughs> Come on, buddy. And say hello to us. I've put myself where I think he's going to go. The always nicest approach with elephants is to let them just come to you. He stopped though, he's going to have a nice snack on, pull a branch down. And that's what I love about those trunks. That delicate work that they were doing earlier <clears throat> and then exerting such power without even thinking or trying. <laughs> Stripping away at the leaves now. Totally dexterous and yet so powerful. And that, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is the same tree that snapped a branch and sent me sprawling across the road a couple of days ago. Same type of tree. So maybe it's not that hard to break. If I could do it, then an elephant can too. And Gilly, you were, <laughs> you were chatting still about Eric's question about the elephant's feet. And you said you've always imagined elephants walking on wedges. So essentially there's a cushiony bottom at the back where the heel is and then they step forward onto their toes or that their foot is positioned with the toes taking most of the weight in the front. And that's exactly right. You described it as a, as a woman wearing wedge shoes. That's exactly <clears throat> the way it is. Um, and you said that that's probably why they're not so good at negotiating hills because they imagine trying to negotiate or climb a hill or hike up a mountain wearing wedges. In that respect, I love your description by the way, I think that's perfect and with your permission I'm going to utilize it in future when describing elephant's feet. And in that respect I have seen and found elephant dung on top of the most bizarre places that you would never expect them to get up to. Watching them negotiate hills and rises, an elephant can go pretty much where a person can go short of the person having to climb. So anywhere that you could get to on your two legs, an elephant could in theory get to as well. I think it's just more a preference not to. Although I suppose I like your description, maybe wearing wedged shoes is the perfect way. And just to finish up with Eric's question, to sort of, I, I wish I had a picture of it. Somebody did send through, one of our viewers sent through that picture of the elephant's foot in the Lataba Museum. And I'm going to try and sort of, I don't have anything, I don't have a way of demonstrating this for you properly, but I'm just going to use my hand. So essentially, this, if you imagine a circle around my hand, that's the elephant's foot, and then there's a spongy, my one hand is the spongy cushion, and then this hand here is the toes of the animal. It's sort of, they sort of rest like this, with a spongy cushion underneath the heel, and then the weight taken on the digits. Now, I said that they're one of the only other animals to have this foot structure. 
Oh, brilliant. John, thank you. Apparently, John, you posted a picture of the elephant's foot anatomy, which really helps because then I don't have to do this bizarre demonstration that I was attempting. But John, um, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Oh, yes, and I said there were two animals or two uh, types of animals that have this foot structure. One is the elephant, the other is its closest relative, which is known as a dussy or a rock hyrax. Tiny little rodent looking mammal. And it's not just their feet that they have in common with the elephants. They also have nipples between their front legs, which is quite unusual out here. It's only really the primates and the elephants that have nipples between their front legs. And it's their teeth structure as well is what groups them together in their evolutionary background with elephants. And he's made short work of that silver cluster leaf. I thought he was going to come and follow his friend, but he hasn't decided to yet. Here he comes. Hello, boy. You can come. You can come. Elephants are very clever feeders. They have an enormous impact on the ecosystem, as you can imagine. And as you can see as he walks behind this tree that was clearly pushed over by an elephant. Hello, boy. Don't worry. Oh, you're after this one now. Yummy. Oh, well done. And we can actually observe Don and Miller's comment in all of, the, all of the elephants feeding on the different plants out here. So Donna commented that it seems that the elephants don't interfere with the marula trees themselves. And they don't generally in fruiting season because they've got access to the fruits. That being said, at other times of the year, particularly just after the dry season, they will go and push enormous marula trees over in order to get access to the leaves on top. But for the most part, the elephants and the trees out here are in a perfect harmony balance. And elephants are as crucial as the other animals out here in terms of shaping the ecosystem. There's a very delicate balance between grass layers and tree layers. If you've got too many trees, your grass can't grow because it doesn't have sun. It doesn't get any access. It essentially gets outcompeted by the trees. So having elephants around to help shape and act as bush clearers, in a way, is one of the aspects that maintains the ecosystem and the balance in the way it has been for the last however many hundreds of thousands of years. They're a crucial part of the ecosystem. enough for them to live on. You've seen how quickly they gobbled up just a handful of those. So it's more a nice snack with some nice vitamins and a bit of sugar for them more than a nutritional basis of their diet. I think they enjoy it though. I'm actually quite looking forward to eating my first marula fruit of the season. I can't believe it's taken me this long. And everything out here loves it. Monkeys, elephants, it actually makes collecting them quite tricky because everything out here wants to eat them and generally gets there before we do. These gentle, 
giant Maruda trees provide us with so much in the way of nutrition and shade. I'm just going to stop here and check and see if I can find a nice ripe one. It doesn't look like it though. What a pity. I love these trees. They are so, so beautiful. They make for perfect shade trees. They make for perfect leopard perching positions, in theory. I always look at marula branches and think, if I were a leopard, that's where I would be lying. And that's why we often see animals like karula sleeping in the boughs of the marula trees. There's no thorns, plenty of shade. They also carry an incredible significance in terms of local culture. So marula trees, and you can sort of see why, in terms of giving the life that they do, and also because they have males and females on separate trees. They actually play quite a big role in producing children and fertility as a symbol of fertility. So for couples who, have, who want to have a child and they want either a boy or a girl, if the woman is pregnant and she wants a girl, she will either make a potion concocted from the bark of a marula tree, but it has to be a female, so one that produces fruit, or she will sleep with the marula branch from a female tree underneath her pillow and vice versa if she wants a boy. Here's some eddies for us and a buffalo. So yes, marina trees actually come with quite an importance out here. I think the buffalo have decided that they don't want to be included in this. I'm gonna find us a nice view. I will be able to reposition. Settled by the elephants. I wonder if they've just been chased. Here we go. Let's go. Let's go. That, that, it's coming. They're coming. <laughs> Two young boys trying to throw their weight around. Do not chase them into me, please. And thank you. a nice clear path for the buffalo so they don't feel blocked in but I don't think they feel terribly threatened by those two little pipsqueak elephants <laughs> hey boy you've seen it all before shenanigans of young male elephants he's not impressed that's why they looked so skittish they were being chased by the elephants or attempting to <laughs> boy. Shame, do you want to come past here? Let me move so you can come past. And get away from those two silly boys. I will be able to get quite a nice view, so I'm going to go around. Rather than going off road, we don't really need to. So the elephant bulls that tried to chase that buffalo, they were about, they looked to me to be about maybe 10 or so years old. So essentially, parlors dashing about, all happening here, out near quarantine. So essentially they're acting on teenage hormones, trying to throw their weight around and pretend to be bolshier than they actually are all big and tough. Oh, goody. Oh, my word. Okay, well, we're spoiled for choice here. This little family of piglets is the same one we were watching yesterday. I'm hoping if we just sit here, they might be brave enough to come and say hello to us. Six little pigs. <laughs> All foraging around in the shade. And the reason why we're seeing so many animals around us is because this area is a seep line. And I know Brent's chatted about it before, but it's a good place to start your afternoon safari because they all seem to come here for snack time in the afternoon which of course is something that the predators will know as well. Come on little piggies, don't be shy, hiding in the shade. 
all six still alive and well. Wish we could join you today, hey Andrew. It's actually quite warm. I'm spoiled for choice. There's elephants come about to come across the road. There's pigs here. There's coolie there. I'm not quite sure where I want to go. Let's go look at the eddies before they disappear. Oh, and a majestic male kudu just to complete it. Troublemakers that were that are moving at the back of the herd, teasing buffalo right at that teenage age, where they are going to be kicked out of their herd at some point fairly soon. Most of the herd has managed to find another ruler tree. No, I haven't, but I'm trying to think if it's likely, and I actually wouldn't be that surprised, Jennifer, if it was the case. I wouldn't be surprised at all if they went and had an exploratory nibble. I know that there are, that domestic cats and dogs also sometimes like fruit. Here's a very tiny baby, which is why I'm giving her plenty of space. It's a female with the snared trunk and her little youngster. Brand new baby. Yesterday or the day before, apparently, was the first time that we saw it. <laughs> Experimenting. Look at that. Trying to imitate mom by chewing on a stick. At this age, she is far too young to be eating solid food. And essentially, what's happening here is monkey see, monkey do, or elephant see, elephant do. She's trying to copy mommy. Also learning the crucial bits of coordination with her trunk. Careful, mommy. Baby's trying to hide under you. Stay sheltered from the sun. She's <laughs> so cute. We often get asked about little elephant's trunks and if they know how to use them instinctively, if they have to learn. And spending time watching them, you can clearly see that that coordination takes time, much like babies and toddlers learning to use their hands. Some things are instinctive, like that grip, but the finer details are not terribly easy. Hey, little one. Especially when your mommy's trunk looks totally different to yours, hey? have a good sniff and in and in fact they are so uncoordinated that baby elephants are actually born with trunks that are slightly shorter in proportion to the rest of their body so that when they run they don't trip and fall over them <laughs> which is one of the cutest biological thoughts or biological evolutionary advantages and they're very often suck on their trunks. It's almost like a comfort, like sucking on a thumb. Hey, tiny one. Hmm. 
Mommy's not making your life easy, is she? It's such a thorny, stick-infested environment that she's brought you in. I mentioned this yesterday when I saw this calf briefly. I have quite a soft spot for the particular female concerned. It's definitely, I'm familiar with her. She's got about a third of her trunk missing. You can see it's shortened, it doesn't have that flexible tip. Oh, tired of negotiating sticks, Mom. I'm off. I'm going. But she's still perfectly coordinated. She's got a little bit of a nick in her left ear, which is how I know it's her. So it's really a nice moment. We haven't seen her in quite a long time. I'm very happy that she has a brand new calf to show us. She tends to be quite, I mean, not, not more feisty than any other elephant, but she definitely has a spirited side. nice and open. You should be able to get a nice clear view. Here we go. Still nice and relaxed. <laughs> the baby's still practicing trunk and eating motions. Hey, little one. And mom doing a very good job of making sure that where she does stop to feed, she does so in the shade. And as you watch that baby walk under mom's tummy, that's a really good way of aging little calves. So when they can fit like that, they are most definitely under a year old. This little one, I would say, must be about, I don't know, maybe two months, maybe three. It's not brand, brand new. It's still very tiny. And it is a female. So in a, essentially, this elephant with a snared trunk, as we discussed yesterday, is basically starting her own new herd. She's always had two youngsters with her, probably previous calves one female and one male, if I remember correctly. And Cindy, Cindy is watching in Pennsylvania. Welcome to the Sunset Safari. Cindy, apparently you've watched a video of a birth of an elephant in captivity where the mother actually kicked the calf to get it breathing. And you're wondering if this ever occurs in the wild. Um, not to the, yes, it probably does. As to whether or not it is to get the baby breathing or whether it's to encourage it to stand up is a different story. So animals out here, they, their babies have to get up on their feet as quickly as possible. And you'll see it with, wildebeest, you'll see it with impala, any of the animals that give birth immediately will start to even nudge or kick their little ones to try and encourage them up on their feet as quickly as possible because obviously there are always predators waking in the, waiting in the wings and even a brand new elephant with the protection of its mom is still vulnerable to attack. Whether or not it's to get them to breathe, I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised. I suppose it's like smacking a baby's bottom. Although I imagine the two meter drop would probably help. <laughs> you know, that drop for the birth would also play a role. It's not quite two meters an elephant, it's about a meter that the baby drops. And usually they do give birth standing up, as far as I know. It, it would be interesting to know. I don't know their particular birthing habits. 
Christmas? Where's a good example? Not really. Um, so essentially, those tusks that are growing out of all of the elephants we've been watching, obviously the babies aren't born with them, and they are teeth, and they start to grow, the, the permanent ones start to grow in at about three years of age. But for the little ones, they are actually born with milk tusks, tiny little stumps that aren't always seen, actually, even on the, even from the outside of the youngsters. And Teresa, who is watching in Virginia Beach, you know about the milk tusks that fall out and get replaced by adult tusks. You're wondering if they ever get found on bushwalk. I've never found one, personally, and I'm, I don't know of anyone who has. Somehow I feel as though Brent, if anyone has, Brent has found one on bushwalk. So maybe Teresa, when he comes out, if Rusty does manage to start driving again, has her wheel put back on, then perhaps we can ask him. Somehow it feels as though Brent has found a milk tusk on a walk. I don't know why. I wouldn't be surprised. It would be very, very lucky. I'm not even sure how you'd identify it as an elephant. I mean, we know they look like teeth, but it could easily look like a warthog tusk or something like that. And it's so, what's so nice to see and with this female is I, I said I have a soft spot for her and I really do and Elise you were wondering whether or not that shortened trunk so she doesn't have that prehensile tip that other elephants do you were wondering if in the drought and these harsh conditions at the moment whether or not that will disadvantage her in any way oh my goodness some very cross elephant sounds coming from quarantine probably an argument over marulas um, and in answer to that question, I don't think so. I hope not. It does take her longer to feed. She does seem to struggle a little bit with it. And I think that could be re one of the reasons why she's had to move off on her own. Either she was separated from her herd when the injury originally happened, or she's found that she struggles to keep up with the rest of the herd and they just stopped waiting for her. And I mean... What I can actually do is let me move forward. So you can see her. She does just take longer when she feeds. There we, go. we should be able to have a look at her trunk now. She needs a bit of extra time in wrapping her trunk around the branches. It's not quite as coordinated or smooth, but at the same time, because she started her own herd, she doesn't have to feel rushed to keep up with other elephants. The herd will revolve around her. It will be when she decides to move. So she can spend as long as she needs to to get the same level of nutrition that another elephant with a normal trunk could. But I hope not. I, I hope it doesn't disadvantage her. I don't think so, though. She's perfectly happy. She's obviously born at least three calves now with the new arrival. But you can see, it doesn't quite have the same. I've also noticed with her, while we watch her feed, is she very often does direct bites from trees, more so than an elephant with a normal trunk. And she gets around. You see, she managed to break off that twig that she was after. It's just more painstaking <clears throat> than anything else. Now that call that we heard earlier, that trumpeting sound that came through, now are you wondering if that comes from an elephant's trunk or whether it comes from an elephant's mouth? And the answer is its mouth and its vocal cords, but the trunk can be used as a resonating chamber as well particularly with the large openings. Have you ever seen an elephant skull? They've got some interesting shaped cavities around where the sinuses meet up and join. Now that does act as a resonating chamber. And quite often, oh, is it lunchtime? They're coming in for a feed? No, just, just, some, um, just some contact. Elephants are very tactile creatures. 
that bond between mom and calf is very, very powerful. And it's often reinforced by touch. So yes, the, the trunk can act as a resonating chamber. A lot of the time, those squeals and trumpets that you hear actually come from the babies. It's very common for them to have tantrums when they are denied access to milk. So if, for example, they're feeding and they're not quite done suckling and mom moves off, very, very common for a baby to squeal. They also, as soon as any kind of game gets a little bit too much for them, or they get hurt or pushed by another elephant, they will scream to let their moms know that they're upset. This little one's still got a long way to go in terms of using its trunk. But mom, of course, will never ever regain full use. The trunk will never grow back. Now, Brian, apparently when you were in the Sabi Sands, you saw an elephant with a short trunk like our female. And apparently the guides that were with you speculated that she might have been kicked out of the herd. And you were wondering if the same thing might have happened to this female that we've been watching. And Brian? Um, I'm not sure. It's hard to speculate. I think in terms of kicking elephants out, I don't know that it really happens in such a defined or deliberate way. I think it's more that it gets to the point that the herd, that she would be disadvantaging the herd, and they no longer stop to wait for her to be able to catch up in terms of giving her enough time to feed. And eventually she might, between that rejection from the herd and her own need to try and meet her nutritional needs, you probably find that it's, it's quite a gradual process. I mean, I, I wouldn't expect elephants to actively kick out a herd member in the same way they do with males, for example, but they're, they're amazing animals, they're complex animals, so I guess it's entirely possible. <laughs> I suppose my answer to you, Brian, is yes, maybe, but probably it was more of a gradual process. Luckily, her air, air conditioning units are thoroughly intact. That flap of the ears. She's looking in brilliant condition. She doesn't look thin in any way. She's now shoving her daughter, her oldest daughter, out of the way so that she can get access to the tree. How do I know it's her daughter? Um, I don't. But I strongly suspect that it is. I think it is unlikely that another member of the herd would split away with an elephant that wasn't her direct mother or daughter. Those relationships within herds, of course, every elephant in a herd is related in some way, but some are more strongly bonded than others. And even when a new calf is born, it doesn't in any way destroy the mother's bond with her youngsters and four females Born. <laughs> that is a very big stick for a very small elephant that isn't ready to eat solids yet. But you're very clever. Well done. Oop, you dropped it. Try again. Oh dear. And it's a sickle bush, so it's got so many thorns. Try again. Dropped it again. are quite set on trying to put that branch in your mouth, aren't you, little one? You're going to hurt yourself. There's thorns. I oh, know this isn't, it's not too bad. It's not so thorny. It's so much fun watching them explore their world at this age. And so much learning is done, just like with children, through actively touching and playing and exploring with their trunks, much like a toddler would explore with their hands sometimes to the distress of the parents, of course. 
But Darlene, you were wondering, you said that you've heard that elephants' eyesight is not fantastic, it's moderately good, and that you've heard they find their ways using their trunks, and that you've heard of cases where blind elephants have led the herd, and you were wondering if I've ever encountered this, or it's entirely possible. Darlene, it's for most of the animals out here, their eyesight is not their primary sense. Look who's come to say hello. Hello, boy. You done chasing buffalo? You're going to come try to chase us now? You are very scary. <laughs> Even at a young age, there's still such a depth to them and the way that they operate. And as we watch that wonderful trunk at work, Darlene, as I said, most animals out here, their sight is not their primary sense. So a combination of smelling, feeling with their trunks and hearing would be more than sufficient, I would say, to build up a picture of the world around them. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if a blind elephant was seen leading a herd. You'd probably find that it would not be the matriarch, but be maybe due to age, it was quite a high-ranking female. <laughs> Bit of a leg swing. And that quite often what happens is one of the, either the second or the third of command, one of the older females will lead a herd and the matriarch will remain behind and move at the back, forming something similar to a rear guard. And we chatted a lot about it with that black, amazing black mamba sighting and the way that they essentially see their world through smell. And for the animals out here, it's quite a similar situation, not quite as pronounced, obviously, but they do have incredible senses of smell and touch. And within an elephant especially, they've done research into their, their brains and the nerve pathways within them They've got highly, highly developed nerve pathways. I have chatted about this before, about the fact that um, they've got nerve pathways that only dolphins and whales and the great apes, and we have, in fact, which makes them incredibly intelligent. Most of that is centered around emotional and social development, but part of that is also to do with socio-proprioception uh, of the world around them. So essentially, their sense of three-dimensional space and how they fit into it. In that respect, they're probably the best at it out of any of the animals out here. And apparently they also have self-image recognition. So if they see themselves in a mirror, they're able to work out that it is themselves that they're looking at, which is also very rare. Something that's limited to apes and to dolphins, as far as I know. It wouldn't surprise me at all that an elephant without eyesight could walk quite comfortably through the, bar through the bush. Ooh, we've got another one of the young boys. It was these terrible twos, or this terrible twosome, that chased the buffalo earlier. You little rascals. You're causing trouble. Well, they're still very young. I'm trying to work out how they fit into this whole dynamic because our shortened trunk female has always been accompanied by two youngsters. I think the youngster on the right is her other calf that's always with her. And I think they've been joined by two young males that have only just been kicked out of their herd. And they've been keeping them company. I'm fairly certain this little one coming up here is the female's young male calf. He looks about, oof, at a guess, four or five years old, which should be about right for being the older sibling of the brand new calf. Now, one thing we get to see a lot of is because we get to spend so much time with breeding herds of elephants, we very often seen calves fast asleep often lying on the ground. But Monique, you were wondering whether or not the adults ever sleep, and if they do, do they do it lying down? The answer is yes, they sleep, and they actually sleep. I've, I've encountered one or two elephants that have been absolutely passed out 
It's usually for quite a short period of time, I would say shorter than the calves. But they do lie, and they can lie down. Even full-grown elephants can, I've seen, lie down flat, completely flat out on the ground and go to sleep for a while and then get up. They can't lie there indefinitely. Obviously, it puts pressure on their internal organs. When you're that heavy, you've got to be careful of how you position yourself. And quite often what they like to do is either lean against a tree or a termite mound or a sandbank, something that just makes getting up a little bit easier because if you watch them get up it's quite a laborious process they sort of have to rock their body weight and they will sleep but for slightly shorter periods of time than the little calves do and in fact i wouldn't be at all surprised if at some point fairly soon our little calf decides to sorry i'm trying to look and see that's another male approaching right at the back Yes, I wouldn't be surprised if the calf decides to go to sleep. I mentioned earlier that luckily for our shortened trunk female, her air conditioning units are still perfectly functioning. And of course, what I meant by that was the flapping of the ears, which are brilliant cooling for the elephants. But Mimi, you've been very observant. Mimi is a 15-year-old viewer and has noticed that in baby elephants, they don't flap their ears as often as the adults. And Mimi, I think that's for two reasons. First, they don't get as hot as the older elephants. Oh, there we go. It's going to come out and we can see what Mimi was talking about. But, so first of all, I don't think they get as hot as the big elephants because they are smaller, so they retain heat, or they don't retain as much heat. Oh dear, <laughs> does that stick ambush you? And then also, Mimi, I think that they are still learning that particular coordination. So although it's instinctive, the elephant doesn't have to think about it, the baby elephant's muscles still have to learn that movement and learn to coordinate it. So I think it's just a matter of being time and the fact that they don't get as hot so they don't need to cool themselves down as effectively. Although mom does make sure to keep her little one in the shade. And very often if they're in an area where there is no shade, the adults will stand around the youngsters and form an umbrella to help to keep them cool. That, of course, isn't that common out here. It's something that you're more likely to see in the desert elephants. The young female in front is, I think, her oldest calf and will practice her mothering skills on her younger sister. She will be practicing her mothering skills, as I said. It doesn't always get to the point that um, the calf or the previous, the mother's previous calf is that impressed with the arrival of a youngster. And Pam Shirley, you were wondering if, <laughs> hey, look who's coming to say hello to us. Sorry, the warthogs have just moved right behind the car. I'll wait for them, I think they're gonna come to us. But Pam Shirley, you were wondering if a previous calf will ever suckle at the same time as a new calf? And the answer is no, the mother won't let it. So once that new calf is born, you'll find that even if the youngster hasn't been weaned, she will then wean it and only allow her new baby to suckle. But for the most part, the interval, especially with the two-year gestation period, for the most part, the interval between elephant calves means that they can, or that they are already weaned by the time the next one is born. Since they have moved off, I'll take this opportunity to show you the water. Just have to reposition slightly. It's 
so nice to see how much more relaxed they, this little family has become. We're starting to see or to enjoy more and more really pleasant warthog sightings. Brian, who is watching from Toronto in, in the middle of winter. It's an absolute pleasure. I'm glad I could answer your question. It is one of the, the things that I love the most about these live safaris that we do. It's the fact that we can have conversations with our viewers halfway across the world. And I mentioned this before as the fact that as a guide, as a normal guide, <laughs> I wouldn't describe what we do as normal. Trot, 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 trot. Well, one lagging behind. But as a guide guiding guests, typically you get to have a conversation with people on the back of your vehicle. You get to gauge their reactions. You get to chat to them and you get to really see the impact on, on the lives that you are, on their lives that you're having. And you get to share the joy that they feel in those sightings. So that's what makes these questions for me one of my favorite things. The questions in the comments does make it feel like you're on the back of the vehicle with us. And I think that without them, it would be a very strange experience. You'd, very, you'd feel very much as though you were talking, or I would feel as though I were talking to myself, or maybe a bit to Andrew as well, but it just wouldn't have the same feel to it. That's why we're always, first of all, or one of the reasons why we're always sending or requesting that you guys send us your thoughts and your feelings and your questions. But it's also a good way of reminding us when, first of all, taking a, a sighting into more depth, but then also for new viewers, an opportunity, because sometimes we forget and we talk to the regulars, and then a new viewer will send through a question that says, hey, actually, I've never been on safari, I've never been here before, I've never even seen an elephant before. Can you tell me some more basic facts about them? Andrew's just going to do a quick screen clean because the dust is building this afternoon. Hold well on, Andrew. I think this is going to be our last view of this particular Ellie. Half. So we'll just have one more look at her before she moves off. They're moving into quite dense vegetation, and I think it's time for us to move on as well. But before we do, Kat, you're wondering if I've ever seen an elephant or a mommy elephant trample her baby. And it, you are absolutely right. It always amazes me as well that for such big animals, they are so spatially aware. I have seen elephants, little baby elephants, get shunted and pushed on occasion and occasionally nudged by the foot of the mother, but almost always it's looked entirely deliberate. And I did have a sighting a couple of weeks ago where a baby elephant accidentally or approached a female that wasn't its mother, and she turned around and kicked it quite hard, actually, in the head and sent it reeling. But I think that's more a deliberate approach. For the most part, they're surprisingly gentle and aware for such large animals. You can imagine how difficult it must be with a little thing like that scampering around your feet. Are you gonna go to sleep or are you digging? <laughs> I love watching ladies. They fill you with such a sense of peace and security. Okay, thank you girl. I think that it's time for us to head out and go find some other things. Let's pop over to Gallego Pan. Enjoy some time there. On a hot day like today, all of the groundwater has essentially dried up. So the water holes are a good place to go and look for animals. Here's the road. Quickest way back to the road.
Now, of course, you will have noticed that you have spent an inordinate, inordinate amount of time on the back of this particular vehicle. And both David and Gaia, you were wondering where Brent and Scott are. Um, <laughs> I'd like to say they're out taking it easy. It is actually, Brent's going to be out shortly, I hope. I'm not quite sure what the progress has been. It, to fill you in on essentially what happens, Rusty's wheel nearly fell off. Um, we caught the problem just in time. The wheel bearings were starting to, they were completely shredded. For those of you who are mechanically minded, her right front wheel, the bearings were not even sliding or turning. We had noticed a bit of a thunking sound that got progressively worse, and luckily we checked when we did, or we would have had a far bigger problem. So VM rushed out to drive to Hoodspreit, get us the spare parts, and Opal, our wondrous mechanic, is working on it as we speak. Now you could be, in all likelihood, you should be seeing Brent out and about at some point. As to when that point may be, not entirely sure. <coughs> And then as such, it could be that you also might have the pleasure of my company for the next three hours, or the entire three hours. D. D is also watching in Canada, like Brian, but in Ontario, and D would like to know, uh, Stephen, would like to know um, if there are any giraffe near us. Not that I've seen, but you never know. There have been giraffe around the seep line area quite a few days in a row, so I'll keep an eye out for them, Stephen. See if I can spot them. When was the last time? I think I saw a giraffe yesterday at some point. They are around. And what's actually been nice is we've seen more giraffe than I remember seeing when we first when I first started working here about seven months ago. A track quiz. I have a very interesting track quiz. I just have to position us so that we can see it. Oh, and I'll be so impressed if you guys get this right. And I have to find it again. Hold on. There's a bush right in my way. And are these tracks too close for us? Just too close. Ah, oh, and there's a bush in my way. Okay, hold on. We make this happen. We will make this happen. We will try not to smash Jigger while we do, though. The last thing we need. There we go. That should be okay. Hey. This is going to be a tricky one. I'm going to hop out and show you exactly which track I'm talking about. And let's see if you can tell me what it is. This could be entertaining. So the track I'm looking at is over here. Will you be able to see it from there, Andrew? Thank you. This is the first one, and this is the second one. And there are three toes, and the back toe, which you can't see all that clearly, so I'm gonna draw in, because it hasn't put its foot down very well. The second one was here, slightly shaped like that. Now I want to see if you guys can figure out what made that track. I'm not going to give you any hints. The rest of them have been driven over, so we can't see the rest of them clearly. Three toes in the front, one at the back, and a bird. There, I'll give you that particular hint. Let's see if you can tell me which particular bird species it is. I don't want to describe anything further because I might give it away. Cool track to see. Really nice. It's not often we get to see them. Probably take Jigger out of low range. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can spot lots of tracks on this drive to test you on. Let's see if you've learned a bit from the tracking lessons we've been giving. So this morning, Scott and Brent.
friend apparently had an amazing sighting with Karula, who then crossed into Biffle's Hook from somewhere around this area. That being said, Karula changes her mind all the time. So although she's crossed out of her traverse area, it wouldn't come as a surprise to me at all if she decided to return across here. But one thing I do really want to do this afternoon, I'm going to wait another hour or so, is to go and check on the hyena den. I start to get withdrawal symptoms if I don't go there at least once every three days. <laughs> I get very curious as to what's been happening in my absence. And it has been a while since I've visited them. obviously been watching our show and sometimes you get a bit of a behind the scene glimpse into the way that game reserves are run. Mercedes has noticed a lot of or some electrical wiring in certain areas on the reserve and was wondering if there's ever situations where animals run into them and hurt themselves or get trapped in any way. Uh, first, I want to start with the first one. The first one is elect electricity poles that obviously are too high up for the animals to run into, but we very often get asked if elephants don't push, them in, push the poles over and maybe electrocute themselves. And it's actually fascinating. The elephants seem to know, for the most part, there are limited exceptions, but they must pick up on the um, on some kind of either the noise of the electricity or the vibrations or something that they know to avoid those electricity poles. I've seen rhino rub on them, so they do get rubbed smooth, but for the most part there's very little in the way of animal damage to electricity. Water pipes, on the other hand, are a completely different story, and there's nothing an elephant loves to do more, particularly in a drought, than go and dig up people's water pipes. Now, the other electrical wires that you might see around, there's two, there's two different types. The first are the fences, and the second are elephant wires. So around Gallagher and around Buyatilla is an elephant wire to stop the elephants from moving into camp and possibly pushing trees down on any of the structures. And then the, the fences, obviously, to keep the wild animals from coming into conflict with people, particularly guests. It does occasionally happen that an animal will run into them. Very, very unusual. The animals of this area have been, have experience with electric fences for the last 70 or so years. Oh, not 70, sorry, last 40 or 50 odd years where they've learned and they've obviously then taught the next generation to avoid them. Sometimes in a panic it does happen. Sometimes the animal jumps over a fence and then can't figure out how to get out. It's unusual, but it does occur. The biggest, the biggest victims of fences, unfortunately, and not so much these camp fences, I'm talking about the legal specifications for fences surrounding game reserves. So the external border fence, they have to have a wire at a very low level. And the reason behind that is it's to stop animals from trying to, or attempt to stop animals from trying to dig out underneath them. But what it does mean is it traps animals like tortoises and pangolins, that once they get shocked by that ground wire, they immediately go into their shells, or in the case of the pangolin, they curl up. And that quite often results in their death because they get shocked repeatedly. Very, very unfortunate. It's something that a lot of research organizations are trying to find a way around. Hello, boys. This is the two males that the elephants were chasing. What is that on the one's side? Is that an injury or just a bald patch? Try and have a look. Looks like an old injury. Oh, that's a scar. Don't know where that came from. Could have come from a fight with another buffalo. Could have come from a lucky escape from a predator. 
Oh, buddy, there's not actually that much drinking water. Do you have to do that there? <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, well, I suppose waste not, want not at the moment. Still not ideal. And well done. Mm. <laughs> you guys have all been on the ball at Jen B and Glenn and Ian and Brian and many others got my track quiz incredibly quickly. I mean, I have to make these harder. Yes, it was indeed a hornbill. It was a ground hornbill. So that huge size, plus the fact that the toes are almost banana shaped in the way that they're structured, they sort of curve inwards like that. And for those of you who thought that it was an ostrich, it's not an ostrich. I know that lots of you suggested that it was. It's not a bad guess, actually, I suppose, because in terms of size, it would actually be roughly the right size. But what I want to do now, oh, they've dragged this road too. I'm going to try and find a nice clear patch of soil, and I'll try and give you a bit of a demonstration as to why it's not an ostrich and what an ostrich track actually looks like. Now, this looks like as good a patch as any. The roads are nice and smooth, thanks largely to the drag work of the tires. Let's hop out and I can show you the difference. Oh. <laughs> the entire herd of elephants has just come up to Galago Pan. Um, okay, I'll draw this quickly and then we can go look at the elephants drinking. We have spent a good hour with elephants. So the track that I was showing you essentially looks like this. One toe at the back not the best drawing implement. And then three toes like this. Two of them are almost joined. And the next one sits like this. And when I say almost joined, they're actually partially fused at the base. That makes the, the hornbill zygodactyls. An ostrich has only got two toes. Well, let's draw what an ostrich track would look like. An ostrich track actually looks a bit like this. My very crude, very lacking in artistic merit ostrich track for you. One, two toes, not four. I did that very quickly because I don't want to disturb any other elephants that might wanting might be wanting to come and have a drink. But yes, ostriches have two toes, hornbills have four. I'm always keeping an eye out for ostrich tracks. Having had that conversation yesterday afternoon about whether or not any of you have seen ostriches on live safaris. Apparently it has happened. Well, at least I know that if all else fails, I can go into art. I'm pretty sure I'd be a fantastic artist. In actual fact, when I was at, when I was at school, <laughs> The art teacher very kindly suggested that maybe art was not in my future. Luckily, I was not suffering under any delusions at the time. I was well aware of my lack of artistic merit. Although I think I'd give James a run for his money. I think James's talents lie more in sculptures or sculpturing. You'll also be happy to know that at some point soon, rent should be out in Rusty. Oh, they're having such a nice bath. The heat is probably another half an hour before the car is fixed. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> I left one of the radios on. So you may have heard Scott's 
communication coming through. Um, apparently it's another half an hour until the car is fixed. Luckily we've got elephants having a shower. This would be a very appealing thought if I hadn't just seen the buffalo urinate in that water. But I wouldn't mind having a nice cooling off swim. Oh, oh hello boy. That's actually why I shortened my drawings, my drawing adventure. I had a feeling there was an elephant somewhere. Watch this, guys. You can see how defensive the females are already and immediately giving that big bull plenty of space. He's coming to investigate the females, which he does by sticking his trunk straight between their legs to get an idea, see if there's any chance of a female in estrus. Just look at the difference in size. You can see why females immediately give way to these large bulls. And he is a nice, impressive male. Beautiful big tusks. Everybody's sniffing him now. He didn't come in particularly aggressively. It was more just he was really, really thirsty. But it's been so nice to have the big males that we have had around. Look how... What? He's having a nice long drink. And that's wonderful news. Apparently, Mrs. Sizemore's class is watching the sighting that's happening right here, live. And guys, since you are watching, I would definitely encourage you to please, please send through any questions that you'd like to have, especially if this is your first experience with a safari. We'd love to hear from you. And there's no question too silly that we wouldn't be thrilled to answer. And if you heard that beeping, I'll explain it to you in a moment. But for now, this waterhole sighting is too incredible. And one female not ready to finish up her long drink. But you can see how messy a process it is. It's a nice way for them to cool down at the same time. Cindy, you were wondering, as we watch these elephants use the trink, use <laughs> the trink, the trunk to drink. Here we go, managed it eventually. They pull up the water through their trunk and then use it to transfer into their mouths. You were wondering whether or not the female with the shortened trunk would be able to drink with her short trunk or use it to drink. And yes, she can. I have seen her drink with it. She's absolutely fine with it. Whoops. Got startled by the buffalo. <laughs> One male tried to come in. You can see the, how alert the female was there. The elephants are quite skittish, actually. A uh, young male, that's the young male we were watching on quarantine, by the way, on the right. And you can see how he's brought up his approach to the water short at the sight of that huge male. Very tentatively approaching. Ready to turn tail at any moment if that bigger bull decides to see him off. But uh, elephants, for the most part, are fairly peaceful. We're not... Oh. Oh, I might be wrong. <laughs> the big bull. Shame, buddy. The little guy drink. <laughs> hey, guys. Nice to have you coming right up to us. Popping the virtual reality rig on. Hello, old girl. It's okay. 
It's okay, we're not a threat to you. Hello, boy, you've got... Oh, shame, you can see how on edge the little one is. Being pushed by the big male at the back. <laughs> and he's coming through. He's a really nice big elephant. Going up to have a sniff. I don't think she's terribly interested, buddy. It's very common to then see them put the trunk in the mouth. I've spoken about that before. But what that is, is the elephant equivalent of the Flemin grimace. So that face that mammals pull where they scrunch up their nose and they draw all of the scents into the organ of Jacobson. <laughs> yeah. Buffalo decidedly put out by the fact that they've been pushed away from their water hole. And now that the big bull is gone, the young male has is able to go and have his bath or shower. And my apologies, there was a bit of a, a typo in the message from the class. It is apparently Mrs. Pathmore's class, not Mrs. Sizemore. So there we go, we correct that. If Mrs. Pathmore's class would like to send through questions, he now looks like he's wearing some kind of mask with that wet patch around his eye. Hello, boy. Are you gonna go take your frustrations out on the buffalo now? Because you got bullied by the big male. Yeah, they're not hanging around to find out. It does happen that elephants charge buffalo. They do get frustrated and they like to take their frustrations out to shame. And that poor buffalo is thin as it is. Oops, he's run straight into the other male. Luckily, the other male doesn't exhibit the same sides of immaturity there. Shame, boy. Are you being harassed by elephants? There's a bit of indignation in that expression. The rest of the buffalo settling down a bit. I think they're probably going to make their way back towards the pan. <laughs> Shame. And all he wants to do, all that poor buffalo wants to do is go back and join them. But he doesn't want to run the risk of invoking the, or drawing the attention of the elephant either. So he's just looking, glancing longingly back at them, trying to decide if it's safe to make his move. Oh, the day in the life of a buffalo. Shame, and they're all looking a bit thin, actually. He, he in particular, is in quite bad condition. Looking distinctly underfed. There goes that elephant straight to where I was drawing the picture of the hornbill tracks. So I'm glad we made that a short tracking lesson and not an extended one. Awesome. This is why the water holes are a good place to be at this time of day. wonderful time spent with Ellie's. But one thing I really want to do is I was asked by, I think it was Darlene, Darlene I hope you're still watching, as to whether or not you want to know but about flowers and whether or not we get orchids in the Sabi sands and you would love to see a leopard orchid. As you really want to see a leopard orchid. I'm going to try and see if I can find you one because we do get them. I know that there was a very humorous moment where James tried to climb up to pluck a piece in order
order to check up on that old legend that a leopard orchid could help to end bachelorhood, I think is probably a good way of putting it. <laughs> I've encountered an elephant roadblock. As we can see, there's an Ellie standing right up close to the road. It's our young male again. But I don't want to stress him out in any way. He's already feeling a bit pressurized because of the presence of the big male. But what's interesting is that he's immediately started following that big male. And it's very common to find young bulls associating with older male groups, if they can, just to spend a bit of time. And they will probably, given the way and the complexity of that... And now? You shake, what are you shaking your head at? Oh, the buffalo again. <laughs> gonna go charge that buffalo. Don't you come and chase me now. Uh-uh. No. Good boy. <laughs> Making his way up to where the larger male is. Grumpy. Watch his feet, those wonderful feet as we were chatting about earlier. And Julia, who's watching in Houston, and actually you've raised a point that I meant to touch on, but I then completely forgot about while we were watching that interaction with the buffalo. I think I'm just going to go around this way. It's much of a muchness, really, and it gives the Eddies plenty of time to move off. So Julia has raised the incredible sighting where a female elephant speared a buffalo and went on what looks like from the video but it's very difficult because you don't have any context to it but it sort of looks like a completely unprovoked attack judy i have seen it um, and it's not unheard of for elephants to go and do something like that there's recorded cases i've seen elephants chase impala before sometimes they get startled by the animal I've heard of elephants killing rhino as well. So it does happen. It is quite unusual though, and of course what we don't know in those situations or in those scenarios is exactly what's gone on in that elephant's day or in that elephant's mind before that happens. And what we're gonna to start to see, and we've mentioned it in respect to our sightings with the elephants, but we've also seen it at the waterhole already. Because of, of the drought, and because of the impact that it's having on the animals, you're going to see more and more aggressive encounters between the different species, especially when they come into competition for access to a waterhole. So those aggressive moments. become more frequent. Sorry, I saw a bush back, but it danced away into the bushes before I could even think of getting you a shot. Not a little antelope that we see regularly. Now, Darlene, I think there was a leopard orchid in this tree. Maybe I imagined that. I'll try and find it. Darlene, I was wrong. I don't think there is a leopard orchid in that tree, but I'll definitely find you one this afternoon. <laughs> now, I mentioned that I saw a bush bug. Ah, thank you. Now, I just need to clap. Yeah. Thanks, sorry, Andrew. Sorry. No, no, it's all good. I completely forgot it was recording. <laughs> so what I'm doing now, this might look completely bizarre, is uh, some of you will know that we've been playing with these, with this virtual reality rig, this ball of GoPros. Hey, can you turn off now? This, you, this is why I shouldn't be in charge of anything. Um, don't do a very, no, okay, turn off. <laughs> okay, there we go, sorted. 
So what we what we did there was I had turned on the virtual reality rig when we had the elephant herd work, walking across in front of us. Now the reason I stopped and turned off and clapped is because it's a way of syncing up all of the different videos from the seven GoPros. So the seven different pictures that they've recorded obviously all have to have a way of syncing up. So clapping and a nice sort of a thick clap sound rather than just a click or something like that creates a nice spike in the sound waves. Don't I sound like I know what I'm talking about? I've got no idea. Uh, but yes, apparently that helps to sync. So that is what I was doing. Right. Now, let's go back to talking about things that I actually know about. Thanks, Andrew. I'm sorry. I completely forgot. Ashley is watching in a freezing England, apparently. And Ashley, I know exactly what you mean. My brother's living in Scotland at the moment. And he says he's absolutely dying of cold. Um, Ashley, you were saying that you haven't seen a bushbuck yet on these live drives. And you were wondering if it's a rare sighting and why that might be. <laughs> it's because Scott keeps collecting them in his shower. No, um, sorry, that was just a, an inside joke about Scott and his bushbuck encounter where one of the males tried to move into his outside shower and he encountered him in the middle world about nine o'clock at night. There's a video up that you could watch. You can have a look for it on Facebook if you want to. I'm sure some of the viewers, if you've spotted it, you'd like to share Scott's video of his bushbuck encounter. You can. Very, very entertaining. Um, but yes, we don't see that many bushbuck. It's quite a rare sighting. As to why that is, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know why there are so few bushbuck. Look, certainly there is a argument that this vegetation isn't really the right habitat for them. They're much more riverine based, so they like to be around river vegetation. That being said, I also think it's because they're outcompeted by Nyala. I have never seen so many Nyala out here, and essentially those two antelope fill a very similar ecological niche. I love bushbuck, so if I do manage to find one, Ashley, I promise I will try and show it to you. They're one of my favorite antelope to look at. I think they're beautiful and they're very, they've got something charismatic about them as well. I will look for you, Ashley. But if they are unusual, there's three that live at the DRC, which is where most of the camp lives. Two males and a female. And then there is one female that's been living in Ingers and now apparently a male that likes to hang out in Scott's shower. Scott and Nikki's shower. I'm sure they're going to be approaching with caution in the future. Not something you expect to find popping out. Having some crazy moments over the last few days. There's another carrying on from the topic of unusual animals to see. Rose, you were wondering if I ever see if we ever see honey badgers. The answer is yes. Andrew, I think you were with me that honey badger of time. Yeah. Yes. Where you grab the, the microphone, the radio control to FC and we're going crash cut, crash cut, crash cut. Which is essentially our code for there's something really amazing here. And we did a mad barrel through this streak in the bush. Yes, we do see honey badgers. I've seen them more off air than I have live, unfortunately. And they tend to be quite brief sightings. I know that the guys have had them on bushwalk as well, which is always awesome. And Rose, you'll start to see more of those small and nocturnal and slightly unusual sightings. They tend to be a bit more common as the weather starts to cool down. So as we start moving into into winter, we'll see more and more of them, and that's because as it gets cooler earlier, it gets darker earlier, and you could well see things like white-tailed mongoose, honey badgers are definitely high up on the list, aardvarks apparently, I'm struggling with that one still, what else could you see that would be really interesting, pangolin, if we get a pangolin on camera, it will probably be one of the most exciting things that we could get. 
that would be so interesting. Jennet's also a nice one. Civet would be a nice one. And all of those is a very, very good chance that we could catch one of them on camera. Daker, you're being very accommodating. Usually the Daker's disappeared off into the bushes by now. But she seems to be nice and relaxed. And just to finish off with my chat, while we look at this beautiful Daker, finish off my chat about unusual nocturnal animals. Bob Spooner, you were wondering how difficult it is to find an art fark. Bob, I think I'm the wrong person to ask. I've become something of a running joke in my life because somehow, despite living my entire life in South Africa, having worked in the Kalahari, having worked in the low felt bush area for years and been out every day doing game drives, I still haven't seen an art park in the wild. And for some reason, it seems to be something of a curse, my, my anti art park curse because if I do ever have an opportunity to see one, it has disappeared before I look up. One time I was sleeping, one time I was busy talking on a radio and I missed it. I even went on an art fark capture and I missed it. But please don't take that as the usual art fark viewing experience. There just appears to be something about me because all of the other presenters have had plenty of sightings with them. As I said, more likely to see them in winter and they tend to be quite skittish. Bye bye, Dacre. Thank you for being so obliging. But you never know. This is, we know that there are art farms here. We have discovered their tunnels. I have personally discovered their old burrow networks. And one time where I accidentally was following Tingana and I disappeared into the ground. Gate. Something that's not rare, but something that you'd love to see would be a bat-eared fox. I think it would be a very confused looking bat-eared fox if it had found its way to the Sabi Sands. But you never know when Safari Live has got feeds coming from all over Africa. And we are coming to you live from the Kalahari, then you'll see lots and lots of bat-eared foxes. Obviously, for those of you unfamiliar, bat-eared foxes are a very specially evolved little canid, so part of the, the canine family. Is that right? I mean, no, that is right. It's canine family. I just had a moment. Um, and they have enormous ears. That's why they're called bat-eared foxes. They're tiny. They're about this big. Very, very fluffy. And I actually have a book. I didn't think I had my book, but I do have it. So I'll show you what I mean. This is what a bat-eared fox looks like. Try to find it for you quickly. Bat, banana, no, 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 that's not what I want. Bat-eared fox. There you go. Awesome little creature. More found towards the more arid areas, so we're just outside of their distribution range. But that is a batted fox, huge ears. And there's the distribution. So we are in this white patch. The brown patch is their distribution range. Most of Namibia, Botswana, a bit of Zimbabwe, and then quite a bit of the northern part of South Africa. They are insectivores. So they go out catching things like termites. They live in little family groups and they're awesome. They are so much fun. They play, um, when you drive along the Kalahari roads at night, they play chicken with you. And they run forward a little bit and they stop and look and the whole family stops and looks. And then you turn your lights off and they run a bit more and then they stop and look. It's, they're so cute. They really are adorable. Actually, time has flown by this afternoon. I was going to give it a bit longer.
longer to go to the hyena den, but since we're on the route, might as well pop in in the next few minutes, depending on what we see along the way, of course. I thought I'd come up and check the Bucklesworth boundary, just in case Gorilla does decide to make an appearance again. appropriate for the moment because I have Andrew on the back with me. Now Andrew, all of our cameramen are fantastic with the drone but Andrew I think has clocked more hours than anyone else. Andrew, do you know how many hours you're on? About or how many flights? 450. 450 flights that Andrew has conducted with the drone on bad and I have seen the way that Andrew flies that drone intense concentration as you can imagine but also with tremendous skill he occasionally during big cat week had me holding my breath but i did it very subtly so that he didn't notice <laughs> but i should never have i never doubted his skill for one moment it was just when he was zooming in between the trees that it became quite scary but sarah you were wanting to know if you've ever used the drone to get a good vantage point on some of the larger animals and yes, we have, and we've seen some incredible views of the animals from above. And what's so nice is you get to watch the way that the dynamics play out, the way that the herds move. It's fascinating to see. And what's so cool about it is how comfortable they actually are with the drone overhead. It doesn't bother them at all. They might look up and look at it, have a glance, and then they go back to exactly what they were doing before they noticed the drone. Now one of the most epic drone sightings that I think we've ever had was helping, using the drone to help James find wild dogs on a hunt. That was incredible, it was an incredible moment. It was so exciting, you know, we were flying it over the, the wild dogs and James would lose them and we'd say to him, follow the drone, follow the drone and we'll take you there. And we got to see the way that they move in those hunting moments. And again, if you do want to see some of the extraordinary videos from the footage that Andrew's put together, he's put up quite a few videos on Facebook. I would definitely encourage you to go and have a look for them. They are beautiful. It comes with a, an extraordinary sense of peace. Hey, Andrew, great videos. Go and watch them. Check out Andrew's Facebook page. Andrew Francis. You will find him. <laughs> oh, I didn't think about porcupine. That's from Cindy. Cindy was saying that she realizes porcupines are nocturnal. But couldn't we see them at dawn or at dusk? Yes, and you absolutely could. I slipped my mind. Very silly of me. We see their tracks regularly. And as I said, you're more likely to see them in winter. That's when they come out at dusk. During the summer months, it's a little bit too hot for them, but not impossible. Zebby, where's your friends? Didn't want to know. All on your lonesome. Hello. <laughs> Hello, boy. Checking us out. Where's your herd? Do you not have a herd? We're all alone. You don't look terribly troubled by it. What's a handsome gentleman like yourself doing out on all by yourself? I'm fairly certain it is a male. Very unlikely to see a female on its own. And also, I'm starting now to notice differences, not just in the obvious way, but also the body shape of males versus females. It might be my imagination, but I, seem, I think I've noticed the fact that the males are a bit stockier. Their legs are a bit thicker. Hey, 
Hey, Zebra. I feel you, buddy. I'm also on my own this afternoon. Apart from Andrew, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Nigel. I'm glad you've been enjoying our solo mission. Luckily, the animals are doing all of the work for us. And the zebra in the glorious late afternoon sunlight. Yes, you are terribly handsome, boy. Reasons that he could be on his own? Might be a young stallion who hasn't managed to collect a herd yet. Yes, definitely a male. Just got that brief glimpse of the thin stripe between the cheeks of the bottom. So he might be a young male that hasn't managed to win a female yet and to start his harem or his collection of zebra females. Usually you see individuals like that in a bachelor group, but there's no set rules out here. You do get solitary zebra out on their own. It's just been quite a while since I've seen one on Juba. Okay, well, we'll leave him to go off on his solo mission. We'll carry on with our solo mission. In theory, in theory, Brent is almost at the point of being out and about. He, um, last I checked, was having a couple of comms issues. I'm very glad we did fix Rusty when we did. I mentioned this that wonderful secretive endangered creature that we could get lucky enough to see, and that is the pangolin. And Jeffrey, who's watching in Texas, you were wondering if pangolins ever eat the carcasses of, or scavenge the carcasses of dead animals in the same way that armadillos do. And obviously pangolins do look very similar to armadillos. Um, actually, to be completely honest, Jeffrey, I wasn't aware that armadillos did that. diet is primarily ant based termite based mostly termites and in fact mostly certain species of harvested termites that they really enjoy much like the art bark so they're more specialized in that kind of diet as to whether or not they've ever scavenged a carcass i don't think so i think it's unlikely certainly not common but certainly not a, a regular part of their diet but all animals out here at some point or another you can never completely purely describe them as herbivores although the main base of their diet is herbivore is is plant matter so for example the warthog that we saw the dacre that we saw all of those species have been recorded as picking at carcasses before they go and they have a nibble. It's a way of getting extra protein and most importantly the minerals and nutrients that they can get from eating the carcasses. Very, you know, it's not common practice, but it does happen. And of course, interestingly, there was that article that came out about the warthog that actually actively killed and ate a baby impala. That's very unusual. So if a pangolin walked past a carcass, might it give it a bit of a nibble? Maybe. I don't think so, but maybe. The other very common practice, of course, is to see the animals munching on bones. They love to do that. It's known as osteophagia or osteophagy. The process of eating bones can be absolutely hilarious to watch, especially with giraffe for some reason. Because they hold the bone in their mouth and they try and shift it around backwards and forwards. I'm keeping an eye out. Since we're here and since we're coming up to the entrance, let's go and visit our wonderful hyenas, see if they're up yet. And while I do, hooray, joyous news and jubilation abounds because Brent is up and about on Rusty and I think he would like to explain his tardiness and say hello to all of you.
So finally, <laughs> I'm back. Uh, my name's Brendan Smith. I got Tabs on camera. We've just come out of the uh, the workshop. Uh, it seems like we almost all up and running. And what a wonderful way to start. Even a belated start. Got a young Ellie Paul. Right, yeah. Oh, it's outside camp. There's been a lot of Ellie's around camp today. And isn't that lovely with the dust and the backlight? And picking up the sand and eating some small things there. So, and just to, for those of you who actually understand um, what about vehicles and stuff, what we had to replace was the knuckle bearing and the drum bearing in the front right tire. And those are just wear and tear items. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't have any in stock, so VM raced into town to get them. And of course, it's always easier to take something apart than put it back together. But fortunately, we've got Opa, who's a wizard with a, with a wrench, and he was able to pop it back together in no time. So I have no idea what's going on, guys, so I'm going to get onto the radio. Um, and see if I can get an update for what's been happening. Be, it might be on Shambi, somewhere, west of uh, Tavish, I am one of these, because I left too much... It's a nice little Ellie Bull. Uh, Tim says this is the same when he was filming with Scott uh, a couple of days ago, also on quarantine. Yesterday. Yesterday. And he... Uh, b between drives, I actually saw this Ellie Bull chase a whole little group of baby warthogs. <laughs> Apparently you've already had a look at this Eddie with Jamie earlier on the drive. Um, it looks like it's getting a little bit closer to him um, while I get an update for what's out and about uh, at the moment. Often stations, uh, can I have an update please? Man, uh, copy able. Uh, and there's in Gala in the in the north. Uh, that Mofazi, how close is she to Chita Katan? Uh, a little bit more east from Chita Katan. But when they started to move, I'll let you know. But far inside, uh, uh, Copy, thanks. And you said it's in Kohuma. Uh, it's not, it's uh, I'm not pushing the place now. Copy, thanks. So, guys, there we go. A little update from Arbel. He's from Buffalo's Hook up in the north. And uh, just at the end of drive this morning, I heard they found a single lioness that they think might be part of the Inkahuma Pride. So he's on his way there. He hasn't been there yet. So uh, I'm quite excited to, to see if it is one of the Inkahuma girls. And see, he's eating all these little flowers. And so not often you see elephants feeding on these different species. And uh, obviously it's because of the lack of grass around at the moment. I'd like to know whether elephants have taste buds in their trunks. Sorry, I'm just going to turn down this radio. And, uh, Debra, they don't. The elephant's trunk is its nose, so it has uh, smelling organs just like ours. And the taste buds will be in its mouth. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a, a new earpiece. It doesn't seem to fit on me very well. Funny thing, these. But necessary. Oh, off he goes. Oh, he's got, looks like he's chasing a Nyala. Let's make have a closer look. So quite often these young bulls like chasing Impala and Nyala. And looks like he's actually heading straight down to our camp. Ah, 
Okay, so apparently the Ellie Bulls were chasing Buffalo earlier. So aren't we lucky? And you'll, I'll show you now. Uh, there's some of the Juma staff. Ah, and there's Mama Z and Tandy. Say hello. You're on TV. And uh, this will just give you an idea how close we live to the animals. Uh, so here's the Ellie here. Heading right. There he is. So there's the Ellie marching. Marching through there. And, um, and here is the entrance to our camp. Right there. I'm just going to loop around because he's heading towards the road closest there. So here we go. There's the entrance to the camp. And very funny, Kirsty and Final Control says, watch out for a Nyala. That's where the Nyala decided to dive through VM's window. And uh, workshops just here, where I've spent the majority of the, day, the afternoon. In there is the workshop. And look, we've got the Ellie actually heading down there, but I think we're gonna leave him be. And let's head out and see what else we can find. But Julian would like to know what keeps the big cats from jumping in the Jeep. Well, oh, sorry guys. Uh, Julian, uh, what keeps the big cats from jumping in the, in the, in the Jeep? The Jeep doesn't really smell like anything tasty. Uh, think about it, it smells like oil and grease and, and petrol and, and, and obviously that's not very appealing if you're a, you're a carnivore. Um, if, and we drive carefully and considerably around them. And so they are very habituated to the vehicles and they have no reason to associate the vehicles with any form of food or anything like that. So. That is uh, uh, why they don't jump in the vehicles. Also, if we get into a position where we think they might be possibly upset with us or, 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 or could do something uh, aggressive towards us, we'll move further away. Sorry, I'm really struggling with this thing. Don't think it's made for ears my uh, as big as mine. Big ears quite useful in the bush. We'll hear the, the sounds of the, the animals out there. animals moving between water and food at the moment and there's a really big sort of zone of movement that I want to go check uh, around. Oh, there's more elephant, elephants over there. So we'll come back. There's a couple of them out there. Lovely light there, but we'll come back to those. I really want to just have a quick look uh, around these big Ellie pods around the, the water out there in case uh, Queen Karula has decided to dog leg, which she does do sometimes back towards Juma. beautiful evening and a big thank you to Jamie for holding down the show for so long on her own. Uh, I would have been out there before Rusty didn't need some TLC. Pamela, uh, we would like to know, do elephants ever come visit the workshop? 
They're generally not, Pamela, there's no an ice cream food or grass or anything for them to eat in there. So I've never seen elephants in the workshop. They sometimes have come to feed off the knob thorn at the back of the camp, uh, but uh, normally not. They don't go into those areas. They're quite confined if you are an elephant. Uh, lots of vehicles and things around. Oh, busy road today. And it looks like it's Ephraim. So excuse me while I say a quick hello to F. Hey, Minja. Hi, hello, hello, how's it going? How's it all? Sorry about the dust. No problems. Anything out there? Do you look for Karul? Yeah, we take Karul. We haven't seen any corn. So it's like he's going east. Still east? Yeah, he's heading east. Okay. And then go home and then to the, to the pen. Just one? Or no, the, the whole family? How many is Four. Four. The other young one was running away. Because he's a, one of the... Birmingham. Birmingham there. So there we go, guys. Really good news from Ephraim. The Nkuhumas, after a long absence, have decided to join us again. But we're going to continue and enjoy the rest of your drive. You have out in this car, yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, the Mvubo is active. Right. Enjoy. Bye-bye. So there we go, isn't that exciting? Hopefully tomorrow morning they might head north uh, to come visit us, fingers crossed. I don't think I've seen those girls in a very long time. I can't even think, it must be over two months since I last saw them in Kuruma Line. says our camp looks so open and is wondering do animals ever come into our camp well a couple of species definitely do uh, and they are great raiders of humans uh, and have been for a long time i think our, uh, one of our biggest battles that we're fighting at the moment uh, is with uh, the squirrels <laughs> and uh, the other rodents the mice and the rats uh, somehow it doesn't matter how well you manage to block they seem to find a way into our pantry also, if you forget to leave the door open when lots of people aren't around, uh, the vervet monkeys will get in there and get away with as much food as they can. And our nocturnal visitor, even if you close all the fences, a hyena will find a way in. And if you forget to put the rubbish bins inside at night, uh, we've lost one completely. The hyena managed to drag it off and then eat it up and completely destroy that big, and a big, big black bin. So those are the main ones we get in camp. And uh, where Scott and Nikki, Jamie, my, and myself and Eugene live, uh, we often have uh, Inyala, Bushbuck, and Daika that come feed in our garden. It always pays to check carefully in this area. Uh, it's right on the boundary of two leopard territories, uh, Karula and, and Shadow, her daughter. So quite often when you, you've seen Karula in this area where we had her, uh, we followed her tracks and found her, um, or didn't find her, but followed her tracks yesterday. Uh, it's not unusual that Shadow will come sent not, not too long after uh, her mom's been through. So always good to have another double check. And these incredible thoroughways that are being used between different water points by the Ellies at the moment. Um, always a good spot to have a look for tracks. Quite a, quite a little bird list for us there. Um, uh, two of the rarer birds, although cuckoo hawks we do see quite often around here. Um, we would like to disappoint our African cuckoo hawk or the, and the European honey buzzard. Uh, honey buzzard could be quite a difficult one. Uh, African cuckoo hawk, I haven't seen you in this year. I think it's the lack of rain. A uh, very interesting thing about an African cuckoo hawk, one of uh, its favorite things to eat and what it eats a lot of is chameleons. 
so quite a specialized feeder there and I've seen last year actually not too far from here uh, in the beginning of the year I saw I think about four or five different uh, cuckoo hawk kills of chameleons down and we're getting into that area where we've got these massive ellie pies that crisscross uh, the north western corner of Juma. The proper ellie highway this area. Quite often a lot of other animals utilize these highways as great movement points. these massive elephant pods that are used by lots of different animals. Is that, if we go towards that there and then up to the bird there. Was there, if you zoom in. Uh, lower. Lower, lower, lower. Okay, a little bit to the left. Okay, right there, oh. Here we go. <laughs> now, that, there's a tricky one for the birders out there. Oh, pop down. Maybe it'll make it a little bit easier. Where's it gone? Oh, I don't know if we can make you guys struggle with that one. Let's have a look for a little bit longer, see if it pops out. No, okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna struggle with that one. Okay. It is one that I'm trying to teach you guys at the moment. Uh, it was again a grey-headed sparrow. afternoon as it has been in previous mornings and afternoons. There's another massive early path here. Uh, do we have any gaffer ta tabs? So, uh, well, uh, I, I think I'm going to have to tape this earpiece to my ear. It keeps falling out while we do that. Uh, let's go see what Jamie's up to. <laughs> I'm sure we could fashion some way to get Brent to tie his earpiece into his ear with his hair. I'm sure we could figure out something along those lines. Well, we've arrived at the hyena den, and, and <laughs> just as you came across to here, the hyena cubs moved their playtime. Go forward a little bit. Can we roll? No, we can't. And the three cubs are out the December twins as well as November. There's one of the geese. Fairly certain that's D2 for those of you interested. But they have been gambling about and playing ever since we arrived here. They're getting brave, venturing to the top parts of the termite mounds. November's just run off with a stick that she snatched from the twins. Is making for a delicious teething tool. Yes, you, you mischief. Her spot patterns have come through really clearly now. Hard to believe that is the same little dark bundle that we were watching two months ago. Oh, playing king of the castle. You're going to pounce. You're going to fall down is what you're going to do. <laughs> Have another crazy tumble into the den site. November's gone to harass one of the December twins. You can see the size difference even now. 
that a month makes, a month of growth. Aren't they lucky they have each other to keep each other entertained? Oopsie daisy. What happened there? Did your legs give up? <laughs> well, this is one of the reasons why I love sitting at the hyena dens. We're sitting, how incredible is that, that we are watching these cubs play and you're watching at exactly the same time with us. They have chewed the sticks and twigs around this den site to bits with three sets of cubs, all under three months old. This den has taken a beating, and anything will suffice for a curious hyena cub that wants to play and explore and possibly fall down. A very careful descent there. Now, November and the December twins have been fairly easy to identify. There's quite a clear size difference between November and the two December twins. Also pretty simple to see, but I still haven't seen any sign of the new cubs since my very first sighting with them that they actually decided to pop out into the den, or out of the den, sorry. Now there is an adult at this den site, which is why the cubs are being so bold. I haven't seen any, I can't actually see her properly, so I can't tell you exactly who it is, unfortunately. I think it's probably pretty. I can tell you that it's not corky. We have a new viewer, Kay McGann, expressing surprise that they have names, the hyenas that we're referring to, and they do. And the reason they have names is because we have named them. And the reason that I went along with the naming of the various hyenas, and I did quite a, an extensive chat about it and the dangers of the attachment that you form to the animals when you do start to do that. But for the amount of time that we spend with such unique little characters that spotted hyenas are, and they really are unique, it was becoming absolutely impossible for us to keep track of who is who and where and why. So yes, we have named them just to, for one of the biggest reasons is for us to be able to really be able to identify them and explain a sighting because hyena den sightings can be absolutely chaotic in terms of what's happening. They can be up to 10 individuals running around, if not more. So naming them helps us to keep track and we can actually, in that way, we can actually follow their progress throughout their lives. It's a great way of getting to know them. We've spent hours and hours sitting at this den. And hyenas, to me, spotted hyenas in particular, are my absolute favorite predator. They're always up to something. They always have the light of mischief in their eyes. And so some of the names presented themselves. We've named this, the two sets of cubs that we're watching at the moment. November and then D1 and D2. Jen, I know you were wondering, just a quick update, who have we got coming in here? Sorry, Jen, I'll be with you in a moment. One of the sub-adults. Well, oh, cubs dashing for safety, just in case. So yes, we've named between the viewers, myself and James, and some of the previous presenters, we have named the different hyenas, just to help us keep track of the sightings that we experience here. And also to get a really nice grasp of the dynamics at the den. So social, uh, socially, spotted hyenas have one of the most interesting arrangements that could possibly be found in the mammal kingdom. 
And even researchers who've spent 30 years or 40 years researching them don't always exactly understand what's going on. And of course, different hyenas in different habitats will behave differently. What we do know is that they have a very strict hierarchy system. They are led by one dominant female, that is the matriarch. And spotted hyenas are completely female dominated. So the females are bigger, they have high le levels of testosterone and androgen, which together makes them much more powerful than the males. It's also given them fake male genitalia. <laughs> yip, 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 yip. And both Steph and Janet, you've said that you can't believe how fast they have grown. Mom's milk is doing a good job. And already the December twins, D1 and D2, and Jen, by the way, D1 is the one with the white foot, unless I've mixed that up. But they really have grown fast. And hyena milk, as I've mentioned before, it's one of the side effects of those huge females, is that they produce some of the richest milk that is found by, produced by any of the males out here. And that's doing a fantastic job of keeping these little ones well fed. And as you can see, the spot's starting to poke through on the December twins. We also have a brand new set of cubs that have only just been born in the last few weeks. We've hardly caught but a few slight glimpses of them. I can't wait to see if they decide to make an appearance this afternoon. Since our little hyena cubs have decided to disappear behind the Tambuerti trees, let's pop over to Brent for a bit of an update. We'll catch up with you shortly. So not much happening there in that thoroughfare, so we're going to meander back towards those eggs and see what they're up to. I'm going to give you a quick look here. I don't know what it looks like. I can't see. Uh, not, very, uh, not very pretty, but effective. It's going to be fun to take off uh, with my long hair, uh, with the tape holding the earpiece back in. Not quite sure. I can't really see the monitor, so I'm sure it's a bit of a hash job, but at least it's not falling out of my ear every 30 seconds. saw the distance we're around here. I'm hoping they're out in that nice open patch uh, around Zoe's. Pennsylvania would like to know with the amount of vehicles out on safari every day uh, do the smells of the vehicles affect the way the predator and prey species react okay on the ground Teddy just behind this small little location here right at the base of it there we go running up to it Ooh, gonna run past it chow, 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 chow. there it goes oh there we go a little bird quiz for everyone out there Lovely bird, one of the nicest sounding birds. Feeling a bit exposed into the thicket. Let's see after that quick glimpse who's going to be able to ID it. Uh, and if you can ID it or you'd like to try, use the hashtag Safari Live um, on Twitter or pop an email to questions at wildearth.tv. Hoping those eddies might be trying to silhouette themselves against the sunset for us. Go. There is an Ellie in the road. Hello, madam, it looks like. Nice, calm, low revs. Oh, it's 
going to have a rub against the tree. Sorry, madam. Sorry. Unfortunately, not all Rusty's little problems are fixed just yet. Uh, we just need to replace a bush still, which we'll have to hopefully get tomorrow. And that's that little metallic dunk that gave that Eddie a little bit of a fright. So, sorry, madam. Let's see if we can move again now. I'm running out of nowhere. Look at him. Off he goes again. Having a grand old time. This is the female who's got, I just noticed now, um, she's got a, a shortened trunk uh, from an injury when she was younger, obviously. Apparently, we saw this elephant earlier as well. It looks like I'm, I'm following in Jamie's shadow. Of the radio said there was male lions calling. Uh, very, far, very, very far from us. Uh, to the north in Buffalo's Hook. So I've seen that female with a shortened trunk quite a few times around quarantine recently. Oh, look at the little one just popping out behind mom's back leg. Hello, little trouble. Practicing, you know, practicing, trying to grab things with its trunk. Staying nice and close to mom, we feel safe. Yeah, so Donna in South Carolina is wondering because this female has got a shortened trunk. Does it affect how she feeds? It does. You can watch her here. She, or, and has she lost the little prehensile tips at the edge of her trunk? She has. You can see how she has to grab quite a lot higher up the trunk than a lot of them do and sort of use a lot more muscle. Oh, look at that. A woodlands kingfisher darting in to grab what she's... Uh, an insect she disturbed. There's two of them. There's the one. And... Here we go. What's, you can see it's got that. Has that got an insect in its mouth? Or is that a stick protruding? Ah, oh, it's a stick. Okay. And there's a second one just to the left. There's on the same tree. Go left, bottom, bottom branch. There we go. Here we go, another one, all looking for insects to be disturbed by the eddies. The eddies are about to move out into that really nice open uh, patch, so I'm going to move around to get on the other side of them. Okay, didn't see you hiding there behind the pole for him. Young female. Hello, madam. Very, very 
relaxed body language. I've spent actually quite a bit of time with this herd before, so I do know them, but one must never become complacent when out here. So the same herd that is so relaxed today could be not so relaxed tomorrow. Uh, they could have had a bad night, you never know. Lions might have been chasing after the baby. Uh, they could have just been in a high stressful situation with a, a must bull. So they can sometimes become, oh, hello, old man. That buffalo bull here as well. Giving us the thousand yard stare. With all his, we don't want to mind it too close to him just yet. We might collect all his flies. Macy says on a previous drive, uh, Scott called an elephant old and she got angry. And he drove away slowly, but can a Jeep outrun an elephant? Uh, Macy, yes, we, you are able to outrun an elephant. Quite often that's the wrong thing to do and you obviously have to be on a nice open road uh, or area to be able to outrun an elephant. Uh, but we can, uh, but normally driving away slowly, most animals react to movement. So if you drive fast, make lots of noise, they'll chase you. You just keep uh, calm and, and hold your ground quite often is the best thing to do. Let's try to get you into the spot for this little guy. So, just to make sure everyone out there knows that the, the Eddie didn't get angry because Scott called it old. I think it was just angry that day. Baby looks like it's got a tick on the base of its tail there. Big grey tick. Uh, Mr. Moustache in Finland is wondering how often an elephant will give birth. Uh, well, it depends when the baby's weaned. <laughs> it's so cute. Wagging its trunk around. Um, so generally, uh, the elephants can be wean weaned from as young as three years, uh, but normally between five and eight years. So they will give birth once the baby they have is uh, sort of weaned. So they can sort of have a baby every sort of eight to ten years, or about ten years, because um, their gestation period is incredibly long. Um, the longest of all animals. Oh, we're getting charged. Oh, it's coming really close to us now. Hello, little one. Look at that. It's right, right next to me. Isn't this amazing? Hello, you little monster. You can see the mischievous in it. It's a little boy. And, and this behavior is quite common for little boys. It feels safe with the other eddies right there. So coming together, a better look at us, a much more curious and close look. Sometimes if the others move away, you might get frightened. So we go charging back to mom. Hello, it is. So it doesn't want to get too far away from auntie there. It is so special when these little guys come close to us. Check for mom. Here we can see her shortened trunk. <laughs> Looks like mom's decided it's time to move on. So cute. and up into the sky, Tibbs. I think with this camera, it's worth having a, a crack at. Um, 
it's not quite full moon yet, but it's there. And it's, I wonder if you guys can, there we go. Look at that, isn't that incredible? That is awesome. Wonder if you can see the man in the moon. There's a song by Ballyhoo. But uh, while those little eddies are moving out, uh, we can just see his little bottom disappearing through there uh, from one Juma baby to another with Jamie. Not quite the same view, but a beautiful moon nonetheless. And yep, babies are still battling it out having the most wonderful game. And while you were with Brent, the matriarch of the clan, or madam, the mother of the new, brand new cubs, did show, make an appearance. She walked through, there was a bit of a greeting, some sniffing from the cubs. They show her the natural reticence and subservience that her role inspires. June also popped through very briefly. And believe it or not, there's an adult hyena den in that den. There's a foot, sort of. You know, pups, cubs, back out again. And off to the right, just behind the trees, I think that's Madame lying down there. Yep. But no sign of the new cubs. referred to this particular clan as the baby boomers and Brian you were wondering if since we do have three sets of cubs all under a year or under three months old and we had three sets of cubs when I first started working here seven months ago you were wondering if hyena numbers are constantly increasing because they seem to be reproducing at such a prolific rate and being so successful and Brian, actually, no, not really. A surprising high mortality for the hyenas. You might see a nice increase in the, at the moment because we are in the middle of the drought. So this clan, for the last three days, has been scavenging off a dead hippo that was on Torchwood that probably died due to the effects of the drought. I don't know for certain. <coughs> it's just outside of our Traverse area. The hyena cubs, uh, the hyena clan has been incredibly successful because of that. And generally the survival rate of the cubs, because they have the protection of the den, is relatively high. It's when they reach the sub-adult stage that things start to get a little bit tricky. Now I think in this particular case, these cubs are all cubs of high-ranking females. That's just sort of something that's come from general observation, the way that their mothers behave particularly around the matriarch. You can't really say anything for certain with hyena clans. It's very easy to get things wrong, and of course it's constantly changing, and they operate differently in different areas. Brian, I think they are successful, but there's still the biggest danger comes at the sub-adult age, so for it's sort of roughly six months June's age, where they start to leave the safety of the den and expand their explorations further found, November's found its stick again. Bored with the two younger cubs. Got something to chew on. Just like a puppy would do. And I'm sure that his teeth coming through are probably oh, distracted by a wasp there. Is that interesting, November? I wouldn't go play with it, though. That will sting you. Sometimes you have to learn by hurting yourself. If she was to catch that spider hunting wasp that flew past, I doubt it would ever be a mistake that it would make again. Now, attempting to debark the tree. <laughs> I love watching hyena cubs because they're so good at exploring their home. And this is always a good sign of a freshly used hyena den or an active hyena den. Chewed up sticks and chewed up pieces of bark from the 
cubs playing around. I think it is pretty that's in the den. She doesn't have the... Oh, it must be. She doesn't have the ear notch that Corky has. So Corky is the mother of the December twins. But the hyena twitching her ears in this den, den entrance is the mother of the cub that you can see. But Brian, that being said, I think that these hyenas will, their clan will do quite well. I put forward the possibility that the absence of lions within their core territory might also have played a role in their levels of at least comfort, if not lowering their mortality rate. They've just got less competition for food. And as we've seen, Juma is their absolute core part of their territory. This is where they have their den sites. They might range onto Torchwood and Biffles Hook, but this is pretty much where the heart of their clan territory lies. I, I, I suggested it as a theory that the absence of lion has been on Juma at least. Obviously, they're still on the surrounding areas. It may be being helpful for them in that respect. I also wonder whether that's not why we've had quite a few wild dog sightings recently. Because I have done research into wild dogs smelling an area where lions have been in and then moving away from that area. But for those of you concerned, I'm sure Brent has updated you. The guests of Oyotella and Juma have been treated to a couple of really nice lion sightings around Biffles Hook and Torchwood. So the lions are around, and any day now they could make an appearance on our live safaris. Uh, I think it's time for us to leave these hyenas to their business. It doesn't seem as though we're going to be catching a glimpse of those brand new cubs this evening. We'll just have to keep trying and come back again maybe tomorrow. And while I leave and go off to find new things for the last few moments of our sunset safari, let's pop back over to Brent. So, we've uh, obviously out very late, not too much time to go too far, but isn't it great to just stop and spend some time with one of the most numerous animals in the bush? And you can see how much those babies have grown. And you might start see start seeing a little bit of a horns pushing through on the on the little boys. You will we'll start to see the bumps. Hello little guys. Me. Um, wait till we see if that we hear that burping contact call between mom and baby. Incredible animals. Uh, sort of almost the perfect design of a medium-sized antelope. That design has remained unchanged for 1.6 million years. One drinking there. Here we go. Having an... And you see, like we saw with the buffalo, how they often knock the udders And that's to try and juice um, milk flow. So well done to Judith and Raisa and James. We've got uh, Lisa, sorry Lisa, not, and Steph, who got the black crown chagra correct. And Steph wants to know if I can do the whistle. I'm afraid I'm not very good at it. Uh, I can't do it. I'm afraid. Uh, I've lost the tune. I might actually have a, a better option than that. Um, black crowned. No, I don't have that one on this. I'm afraid still. I keep forgetting to put the Southern African birds on. I've still got the Central and North African birds. Well, I'm going to do a little perusal. I'm hoping I haven't seen the bullies since I got back from the evening. I'm going to see how many babies might be left. And it seems like they've moved along from quarantine. 
um, as the babies have got bigger, they're not their preferred spot for sleeping over anymore. Switzerland said Scott's found the spot of that perching Verro's eagle owl uh, and can we go check it? I'm actually on my way to one of the spots. They have quite a few different perching spots uh, but we are on our way to check one of them now as it starts getting a little bit darker and then also very interesting this morning and we'll go also have a look if the eagle owl is not there is we found I uh, found a white-tailed mongoose den before we went live in the dark uh, and uh, it could be a slight chance that they are at the entrance to the burrow at this time of the day as it gets a bit cooler. But uh, they aren't quite, the den is very close to the Juma Khan. So keep a close lookout. Maybe one of them will sneak in for a drink in the dead of the night. spots likes to perch uh, we've checked a few as we've been moving around the other spot is actually right outside our camp we have seen him perching here but no such luck anyway well, let's move on to the next perch site full moon yet but it is coming and that's a very strange thing for me uh, to think I always used to love the full moons uh, and when I first worked in the Sabi Sands beautiful and they are so stunning but it is now a time for a little bit of worry uh, in front Abel's poachers to move around a bit more easily at night time so the anti-poaching patrols and that actually up uh, during this time of the, the month and Zoe says when exactly is the full moon uh, Zoe I'm not 100% sure but looking at the moon I would say it's probably in a couple of days maybe as long as four days three four days I'll stop so we can zoom in on it now. And Zoe's also wondering, do we see any crazy antics from animals during the full moon? Uh, not that I've noticed, but one thing, it is it is a bit harder for the predators uh, to catch prey, uh, because the prey, obviously, their eyesight is improved by that. And actually, you even see the craters on it. Isn't that amazing? Fascinating stuff happening in the in the space race at the moment, um, and a very proud that was the first non-government rocket that was able to go up and land it was designed and built by a South African uh, South African company, quite a famous South African in the states, by the name of Elon Musk. So he managed to send a rocket into space and land it safely. And apparently they've now get, got the contract uh, to resupply the International Space Station. Isn't that amazing? And then also today, uh, briefly read a little bit uh, on something called Mars One, which is quite crazy. Um, so they are planning to send people to Mars by 2027. And this is a private company, uh, again, are convinced they can do it for cheaper and faster than uh, they 
government, uh, and if I remember correctly, it's an Australian company, and I think there's about eight or nine Mars astronauts that have been chosen, and one of the main reasons they can do it cheaper than what to do um, is that those astronauts would never return to Earth. So they are planning to go to Mars and try set up a colony uh, and, and live on Mars. Now, I mean, I'm all for great adventure and going to new places, but I think for now that's one step too far for me. And there are no elephants or wild dogs on Mars. So, Killy in Wisconsin uh, would like to know if I'm a Candy Crush fanatic. Uh, James. Uh, while trying to be amusing, he tries to be amusing more often than he is amusing. Um, he was singing a little song while we were waiting out the rain before, or, uh, for a safari um, a, a while ago, and uh, he said I was wasting my youth playing Candy Crush. I'm afraid, Gilly, it's not true. I'm definitely not a fanatic. And I've just stopped here. This is the spot where that little mongoose um, den is. I don't know exactly where it is, so I'm not going to drive off road. I just wanted to come and have a quick look. But, okay, so you see that sort of uh, dead lump of there, sort of almost centre frame now. And if we go there and we go slightly off to the right of that, um, there's a little there, a little heap there. So it's around there somewhere. I think there's a tunnel, uh, a den site from where they're staying. And I saw both of them disappear down the hole there before we went live in the dark this morning. And uh, definitely going to be worth checking this out uh, as, as it gets darker earlier and we might get lucky. Um, and it wouldn't be incredible if we have some white-tailed mongoose babies. So I know, fortunately, I was here for a very short time, uh, but hopefully Rusty is right as rain now. And uh, we'll minus a set of bushes that should be... Whoa, the door opened. I nearly went flying out. Um, but the, I should be right as rain by tomorrow. Uh, sunset safari. So from Tebs and myself, from a shortened trip with Rusty, uh, uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Let's go back to Jamie. Well, whatever James has to say, at least he knows how to close a door. And I shouldn't actually say that because I've also fallen out of the doors before. And yes, I can confirm that their Candy Crush does occasionally get played. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a lovely afternoon. The majority of it spent with those wonderful elephants. It's so nice to see that female and her short trunk wandering around with that new calf, looking happy and healthy once again. And it's also always nice to pay a quick visit to the hyena, de the hyena den and see what those little ones are up to. I'm also really, really glad to hear that Rusty is out and about. I mean, I know that Brent was, I was going to say Brent was trying to take it easy this afternoon, skive off work, but I know that he was rushing around trying to help Opa fix the problem. So it's good to have Rusty back out. It means we'll have two vehicles ready and waiting for the exciting sunrise safari that will happen tomorrow morning. So a big thank you for all of your comments and questions. As I said, we love hearing from you. Thank you, Andrew, for your wonderful camera work. And to Kirsty and to Nikki, who are in FC. Oh, we'll have to find out what the morning holds tomorrow. The night is going to be full of surprises. Karula might decide to pop back in from Wiffletop, or the lions might decide to come and pay us a visit. We just never know, and you will have to tune in and find out. Have a wonderful day, guys, and goodbye.
Thank <laughs> you.